last Sunday, a pastor asked me what uh, graduation, what gradu how many graduations there had taken place here at Longview Christian Academy, and he looked, turned around, and said, "Well, let's let them do the math." We weren't doing the math; we didn't have a clue what it was. I know I look like I've been here since the school opened, and uh, <laughs> it feels like I've been here since the school opened. But the first graduating class, from what I understand, was 1975. So this would make the 40th graduating class at Longview Christian Academy. I have been here for 27 of those. So it just seems like I've been here for all of them. And I, I can't wait to open that because I want to see if the uh, student body paid you to get me a one-way ticket somewhere. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> Since I've been here 27 years, I've had the privilege of working with our pastor in uh, ca the capacity as uh, we were co-laborers. We worked together. Uh, he was the uh, youth pastor. I was the uh, principal of the academy. So we worked together as, as co-workers, and then I've had the privilege of working with him for the last six years as our pastor. Each year, we allow the graduating class to, uh, to vote who they'd like to, to, to be their commencement speaker. And they've once again chosen this year for their, our pastor to be the speaker, and I can think of no more fitting uh, commencement address person than our pastor, so let's make him feel welcome. I failed, I failed to recognize if you're a graduate of Longview Christian Academy. Could I get you to stand right now? If you are a graduate, I am class of 1985, and uh, there you go. LCA Eagles all the way right there. Have a seat if you don't mind. Now, y'all cannot stand yet uh, because you are not there yet. In fact, uh, we are going to uh, have one more class. I'm just kidding, but uh, uh, I am so glad uh, that I can be a part of this. And, and whenever you're asked to speak at a graduation, you always, the moment you're asked, uh, you always take the time to put special effort, special thought uh, into the class. And uh, they're going to set a prop up for me. So gentlemen, if you could bring that in, go ahead and bring that in right now, Brother John. And while they're doing that, I thought it would be good for all of us to take a trip down memory lane. For the graduates, we have secured a picture of you when you were really, really young. And I thought everybody here would enjoy that. So if we could look at that while they're getting that set up for me. And uh, <laughs> you, you got to love that, David. That is like cute. And then Allie. And uh, then the next one, Alyssa. Hang on, hold it right there. Alyssa, that's curly hair right there. And the next one, and... Uh, DJ, you look so cute, and uh, you're still cute, amen? And then the next one is, look at that, look at those eyes right there, and uh, then the next one, David, you got to love that. Really, that's Pancho when he was young, so uh, there you go, and guys, go ahead and put it right over there if you don't mind. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, if you don't mind. And uh, there you go. It's perfect, guys, right there. Perfect, perfect. And uh, that'll work right there. I want to preach to the graduates this evening. And, uh, and I was thinking a lot about this particular class. This class is unlike any other class Longview Christian Academy uh, has ever had. Uh, you blossomed this year and you became your own identity uh, this senior year. And when I was thinking about it, and I'll give you, uh, Matthew 20 jumped out at me because as I was studying, I, I told y'all and told the church several, um, I think it was last Sunday morning or the morning before that I have four veins of study that I'm going through right now. And your commencement exercise was one of those veins of study. I was truly looking at family relations in the Bible. I was looking at how families, how moms and dads would look at their children. I was trying to get a perspective for you as graduates of how your family views you and your greatness. Uh, in fact, my commencement address tonight to the 2015 class of Longview Christian Academy is entitled this, The Best Way to Use Your Greatness. The Best Way to Use Your Greatness. When your family looks at you, they truly see something you don't see, and that's greatness. 
I know sometimes you see yourself as, you know, I don't maybe accomplish this right. Sometimes I feel like I'm maturing only to find out I'm not as mature as what I think I am. And uh, so here in Matthew chapter 20, uh, let's pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to do the most honorable job tonight. Uh, I want to honor the graduates sitting before me. I want to honor the family members who have taken their time to be here. I want to honor the institution of Longview Christian Academy. I want to honor, Lord, the church that has truly paid the price uh, for us to have a Christian school here. And Lord, what an honor it is. And Lord, I ask that you would help me say the right words. I pray that the words would be very, very uh, uh, firm in the kindness of your word and yet very enlightening so that the graduates can leave here and lord i know right now that their mind is probably spinning is swimming and they probably are so in the moment that it's going so fast and so many thoughts and so many emotions and feelings i pray that we'll reach up and push pause and that all of us will gather around the truth tonight and i pray that you'd help us in jesus name we pray Amen. You're in Matthew chapter 20, and uh, it's a story about a mom. A mom knowing how great her sons were. She knew this. She knew that they were truly so great that even the Savior wanted three to be around him at all times. There, there are many indications in the Bible that Peter, James, and John were truly those three that if Christ had pets, they were those three. In fact, you'll notice a lot of times that uh, they are referred to. In fact, even Peter, when the Lord was done on this earth, he said, uh, go tell everybody and make sure you tell Peter. It was very interesting, and, and I thought this is what brought me to this text for your class, because if you'll take your Bible and look at Matthew 20 and verse 20, it says, this then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. And I thought this was very interesting with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Now, if you'll stop right there, this is what drew me to this class and this text. I had three other texts I could have preached from for you tonight, but this one totally stood out for who you are. And uh, when I, did y'all know that y'all don't do anything quiet? Did y'all know that? When you go to study or you go to a restaurant, you kind of take over the entire... I mean, people stop and stare at you people when you're out in public. I mean, Starbucks is one of those kind of deals. IHOP is one of those... IHOP right now is not the same institution. Uh, they now have had to rebuild the entire thing. And here... And I'll tell you where you, you come by it honestly because go to Mark chapter 3 and verse 17... Go to Mark, in fact, everybody go Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. And if I were to categorize this graduating class, here's where I would categorize them because they get it honestly. Knowing who their parents are, they come by this one honestly. Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. Are you ready? Look at it. I thought this was great. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Berjonis, which is, look at this, the sons of thunder. That's y'all. Y'all are thunderous. Your parents are thund. Y'all people don't do anything quiet. In fact, I'm really shocked that your family members are being very good right now. In fact, I can see the mischievousness upon their faces right now. So we have to hurry and get this done. But when I came across this, because the mother knew how great the boys were, she immediately took them to the one who could plot their future. She immediately got them to the top, to the CEO of life. And the mother said this, and go back to Matthew 20 and verse 21. The mother said this, in Matthew 20, 21, I'll give you time for everybody to turn there. And Matthew 20 and verse 21, and he said unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right, right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Because the mom saw greatness, you know what she truly wanted? She wanted her sons, and I brought out a throne here, she wanted her sons to go to the top of where she knew they would end up. She knew that they were so great in who they were because they had watched them. 
And if I had a nickel for every time that your parents have told me there's something special, there's something great. And I don't say that because it's something kind that you say at a graduating class because I can tell you this, out of the probably a hundred commencement services that I have done, I promise you there are some graduating classes that you cannot, you have to be very careful what you say that you're not a liar in the pulpit. But I can tell you this, that you truly have greatness in you. And your parents spotted it a long time ago. Because you have greatness. You will rise in this life. Because you have greatness on the inside, you will go to the top. I cannot wait for years from right now to see where God takes you and what God does with you. And how many children you people are going to have. I just thought I'd say that. In fact, God told me, yes, Lord, I'll tell them, each of you will have 10 children by the time you die. And uh, Jesus' response to his mother was this, and I must hasten. Look at verse 22. Matthew 20, 22, here's what Jesus said. It was natural for the mother to request a special place of prominence because she knew how great her children were. Look at verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Jesus said this, yes, you can sit, you, you can drink of the cup I'm going to drink of, you can be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with, but to give away that spot is not mine to give. It is something that my Father gives. And I want you to notice the wording that Jesus used, which is no accident at the end of verse 23. It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. You know what he was saying? That's not mine to give. It is only my father's to give because it's only something that is prepared by the father for the people who can sit there. You're going to do great things. I don't believe that you're going to end up at the end of your life being less. I think somebody's going to look at you and they are going to truly say about you, there is greatness. But you know the best way to use your greatness is if you keep reading in the text, the best way for you to use your greatness is not by ascending to the throne first. It's not by climbing the stairs to the pinnacle of life here. Because the throne in this day and time, and that's what the disciples truly did not understand, and I'm going to try to help you understand it. The disciples and any believer of Jesus Christ was living in tyranny. They were not living in peace. They were underneath the rule of the Roman government. And Jesus himself said, if you'll notice in verse 25, look at it, but Jesus called them unto him and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and that they are great exercise authority upon them. Do you know what the lay of the land was during this time? He was telling the disciples that throne has a bad taste in everybody's mouth. That, that throne does not represent kindness and that throne does not represent anything but tyranny. And truly, the Gentiles treat the Jews like they're dogs. And even the religious leaders were scared to make a move because they thought the Roman government was going to take away their little kingdom. So the throne, and so when the mother came and said, look, 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 can you put my boys on the throne, one on the left and one on the right, and can you do this for my sons because they've got greatness in them? You know what Jesus said? You don't even understand what you're asking. The throne doesn't have a good connotation at this point. The throne has a bad connotation at this point. Here's my charge to this class. It is not where you sit in life. It is who you serve in life. Please don't walk out these doors with an unrealistic expectation about how to get the most impact out of your life. You and I do not get the most impact out of where we sit. We get the most impact by who we serve. If you will begin your adult life 
on the way to greatness, because you're going to be great, get to the greatness of life by serving the people of life. In fact, right here in this passage, go to verse 26. It's all right here contextually in the same way. Look at it. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your what? Minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your what? Servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to what? Minister. And to give his life a ransom for many. Do you know the greatest title a Christian could ever have is when somebody looks at them and says, you're a minister, aren't you? It's not reserved for those who are in my profession. It is reserved for anybody who is a disciple of Jesus Christ that truly understands the best way to use your greatness is not by sitting on the throne and lording over people. It is by... Serving people. I like to give something to every graduating class, and each of you will receive this. It's a servant's towel, and it has your name on it, the class of 2015. And it simply says, may I serve you. If you will walk through this world, 18, 19, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, as single, engaged, married, father, mother, grandparent. And every day you wake up, don't ascend to what you think is greatness. Just dawn what truly is greatness. You see, we're Longview Christian Academy. You'll notice that Jesus said there is something very interesting. He said, but among you, it will not be so. In the world, that's what everybody fights for. In the world, that's their symbol of greatness. How high the corporate ladder can you climb? How big of the boss can you become? How many people jump at the bark of your voice? That's what the world does. And if the world has any semblance of servant leadership, they did not get it from a past president. They got it from the greatest servant leader of all time, and that was Jesus Christ. But among you, it will not be so. Among you, the Bible is very clear. Look at the words of again, again. But it shall not be so among you, verse 26, but whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm going to give you probably to me what has become very dear scriptures, and I want you to turn to them. In fact, all of us turn to them. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 6. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 6. You're going to find out that these, to me, are the focal point verses for this lesson tonight. In Philippians chapter 2, and look at verse number 6 through verse number 8, it gives us three ways to serve. You can either live from a place that you think is greatness and go ahead and climb up there and be king of everybody and be that tyrant, but people are tired of those kind of leaders. People get enough of that. The world's all about that. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's in government. It doesn't matter if it's in business. It doesn't matter if it's in family. It doesn't matter if it's in an educational setting or even a church setting. People don't like that right there. But people always respond. When you wake up every morning and you put on whatever profession that you're going to put on, wherever God has you, don't forget the last thing you're going to need. How may I serve you? Wife. How may I serve you? Husband, how may I serve you? Children, how may I serve you? Employees, how may I serve you? Church members, how may I serve you? This is the secret. But in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 6, look at it. If everybody will read silently as I read aloud, look at this. Who, 
talking about the Savior, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Can I tell you something? To say you are a servant without having a servant's heart will take you nowhere. If you're going to be a servant, then you have to serve from the three places in your life, and they're found right here. And there is no better example of a servant than Jesus Christ. Now, I understand right now that totally, you probably, your head's swimming because it's like, I cannot believe we're here. I'm going to ball. What is going on? I understand that. And you probably need to go back when you're in the stillness of your car or someplace and listen to the sermon tonight to get a grasp but I'm going to go ahead and give it to you the first time around. That way, when you listen to it the second time you're around, you're going to go, I didn't know he said that. And uh, so here we go. You ready? Look at it. First of all, look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. First of all, serve from a place of royalty. Jesus did not descend and become a peasant servant. He descended, but he was royalty. You see, that'll make the difference in your attitude about who you serve. If you're serving because you have to, because I'm a peasant, then you'll serve, but you won't make that person feel better. Serve from a place of royalty. Don't serve like I'm doing this out of drudgery so I can get the reward. You serve knowing this is what the children of the king do. This is the highest profession. And if my Savior, royalty, look what he said there, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Just because he took upon himself the form of a servant and flesh and donned himself didn't mean he lost any of his Godhead. It simply meant this, royalty came to walk among men, but he did not walk sitting on a throne. He walked serving. Boy, I beg you. Don't leave here and get the attitude that everybody owes you. I love the songs that y'all sang tonight because you gave honor to whom honor was due. And there's one class that I have seen bend over backwards to serve. It's you. Don't lose the greatness. Serve with royalty. The second thing that you're going to find out, look at verse 7. Serve from a place of royalty. I found this to be also interesting, and I love God's word. I love the phrases of God's word. Philippians 2, 7, look at it. But made himself of what? No reputation. Are there words that you have a hard time saying because your tongue's too fat? Are you ready? Here's my word. I have about five of them in the English language. Here it is, if I can make it through this one. Serve from a place of anonymity. Did I get it right? Okay. I will not say it again because it's not coming out the right way. Serve from a place of no reputation. Serve from a place not wanting people to know who you are. Don't serve leaving your calling card and don't serve with your name uh, plastered in life and on lights. Oh, don't, don't, that, that's, a, that's a false humility. True humility is when you serve and if you never get credit for serving, that's okay because the people were served. Go through life knowing this, that your heavenly father sent his son. And look what it said there, but made himself of no reputation. You, you know what kind of servant Jesus was? Jesus was the kind of servant that he healed a man one time. And then he said to the man, and we all know it. He said to the man, now, now, now listen to me. Don't you tell anybody what I just did for you. And you know what the book says? That his fame, it was like somebody lit him so on fire. But he didn't do it. He was always saying, hey, I'm going to heal you, but, but don't tell nobody. Hey, I'm going to pay the taxes for you, but don't tell nobody. Hey, I'll raise your son, but don't tell nobody. When, when they ask you it, just don't tell anybody. And serving truly is when you don't sign the gift, you just give the gift. You, you, you don't sign the check, you just give the check. This past week or two weeks ago, I get a call on a Sunday night. 
And it was one of our one of our men, and he called and he gave me something to give to somebody else. And so I went by the house, and it was kind of a little bit later in the evening than what it normally is for me on a Sunday night. And I walked in, and he looked at me. He said, "Look, now I'm going to do this, but I don't want anybody to know that I did it." And I said, "So you don't want me telling anybody?" He said, "No, do not tell anybody." So I took the gift that he had for somebody else and I gave it to him. Can I tell you honestly that him serving without recognition, truly guess who got the honor and the praise and the glory for that? The Lord Jesus Christ did. You see, when you get the praise, it's truly not serving. It's serving with wanting recognition. May you continue to be the kind of young people that you serve without the praise. Third thing, not only do you serve from a place of royalty, I'm going to try it the second time, you serve from a place of anonymity. Number three, you serve from a place of humility. Look at verse number eight, verse number eight, and then I'm done. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. No servant task should be beneath you no servant task do not qualify serving with what the task is qualify serving is what do you need from me you know you know what we needed from christ because if you'll follow the rest of this verse it says he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. You and I truly have no idea what our Savior looked like that day on the cross. But you know what he looked like? What we needed him to look like. Our Savior did not become what he, uh -uh, he became what we needed him to become. When you go through life, your greatness, what's the best way, pastor, that I can use my greatness not there. The best way you'll use your greatness is here. I know they're, they're, they're just symbols. And I have them ready for every one of you. David, there's yours. And Allie, there's yours. And Alyssa, there's yours. And DJ, there's yours. And Heidi, there's yours. And David, there's yours. I, I know they're symbols. I, I know probably in years to come, your spouse is going to throw it out because they're going to think it's stupid. Why'd you even hang on to that? I understand that. Or maybe, ladies, your husband's going to go, put that on and get to serving. I don't know. I don't know. But I can tell you this. Are you ready? Don't let the truth ever leave you. And instead of qualifying what the job is going to be, just say, what do you need from me? And no matter where you go, what you do, if if you will use your greatness not to lord over people, use your greatness to serve people, then at the end of your lifetime, somebody will say about you, that person made an impact on my life. We love him, talking about the Savior, because he first loved us but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us serve that's the best way to use your greatness I'm proud of you I'm happy for you when you walk out those doors you will enter into a select few in our society that endured to the end and graduated from high school something to be proud of God bless you.